everyone. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you for joining us in worship uh, today. I have just a couple announcements I'd like to mention uh, from your bulletins. Uh, men's group will be meeting tonight at 4.30 instead of 6.30, and we won't be meeting here. We'll be meeting at the uh, driving range down the road, so very serious discussion for men's group uh, going on tonight. Uh, if, if you're a man who likes to hit balls with sticks, please, please join us. <laughs> Uh, the safety team will be meeting tomorrow evening. If you're a member, please try to attend that. Uh, in our goal to pack 200 shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child this year, we're asking you to bring in clothing items for the month of April. You'll see a list of those items in your bulletins, and you can drop those off in the Sunday school classroom across from Randall's. Uh, we're also looking for volunteers for Comfort Care's uh, Stride for Life this year, which will be uh, on May 6th. If you're interested in that, please contact the church office. Uh, you'll also find some information about using money from your IRA to donate to charity, all of which is just completely over my head, which is why Jim did our taxes this year, uh, because he's a lot smarter than, than I am. So please see him with any questions that you might have uh, for that. If you or someone you know will be a graduate this year, please fill out the form in your bulletin so we can be sure to acknowledge them. Uh, also, I'm sure most of you have heard uh, of Bill Heisman's passing this week. Uh, please keep Cover uh, and his family in your prayers. Uh, and finally, next Sunday will be a pulpit swap among uh, a total of seven local churches. Uh, any of those pastors would have been a blessing uh, to you all, but you guys are really going to be blessed. Uh, Pastor Roscoe Harris from Truth Bible Church down the corner. Uh, we'll be delivering next Sunday's message, and uh, I'm tempted to stay right here and, and listen. To uh, Roscoe's the pastor I'd like to be in about 40 or 50 years. Uh, and it's worth being here just to hear him pray. I promise that. Uh, he's a true man of God. Uh, I promise you walk out of here believing that you can just go out there and take on the world. So please welcome him next week uh, with the love that this church is known for. Uh, and don't think uh, that me not being here is a good excuse to stay home. <laughs> Sue's going to tell me exactly who wasn't here. Uh, on Monday morning. Uh, Jessica, do you have anything this morning? Um, not too much. Just like Pastor Billy said, the graduation insert, please get that in sooner rather than later. And um, the next movie night and the volunteer <coughs> needs are in your bulletin. Sue, do you have anything? I'll mention our friend of the week. Olamay Coffee, please remember her, and to remind those who are usually in rehearsals tonight, we have no rehearsals this evening. And with that, Brenda has our prelude this morning as we enter into worship of the Lord. <laughs>
Let's pray. Father, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. You save us and sustain us. Help us to trust in you and to worship in both our abundance and our want. We come before you today laying down our pride and arrogance and confess our need for you. We lay our needs at your feet and worship you alone. Without you, we are nothing. Teach us to worship you in faith and in trust. Fill us with your spirit as we open our mouths in praise to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll invite you to stand and sing our opening hymn, Victory in Jesus. <laughs>
Good morning again. It's hard to explain to somebody what it's like to live on the street if they never lived on the street. Most of the people out on the streets either have mental illness or they have an addiction. I just went over that, ended up getting heavy into some drugs, and I lost my job, I became homeless. I was constantly heat exhaustion, alcohol poisoning. Like I can literally say I was dying. Somehow my parents got a hold of the caddy. And that's what opened up the door for me to become sober. I met Yvonne and she was homeless on the street, came to Friendship House and things began to change in her life. Baptist Friendship House is a ministry center to folks that are impoverished, to folks that are unhoused, and to human trafficking survivors. We're able to provide them a meal. We're also able to meet those basic physical needs that, that others may have. It opens the door to minister to the spiritual needs so that a life-changing relationship can begin with Jesus Christ. We have a creative arts time, and usually that's pottery. They'll begin to open up and start sharing things during that time. When you sit there and you have the clay in your hand, you know what you're going to be doing with it and what's going to be coming with it. But the clay doesn't know what it's going to have to go through to get to it. Sometimes our lives are broken, and we're like just a big old lump of clay, and so lives can be molded, shaped by Jesus to be able to accomplish his perfect will. I have never seen a life change like a bonds, and it's just been amazing to watch God work in her life and then see how he's using her now in our ministry. I never would have thought that I would be where I am today because I had no hope. This place saved my life. When you give to Annie Armstrong, you have to make my ministry possible. Jesus never gives up on you, and so we should never give up on anybody else.
our sponsored reading uh, for this morning is printed in your bulletins. It's titled, In the Presence of Christ. Will you please follow along? You, O oh Lord, hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me up in glory. <coughs> Whom do I have in heaven but you? God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell about all you do. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Our offertory hymn is Because He Lives, and I'll invite you to stand once again as we sing.
comes to share the song, God of the City. Um, I don't know, but it was been approximately, what, three years ago when we closed our church. We weren't able to um, worship on Easter Sunday together. Um, I know that if given the opportunity, each of you would stand up and testify that God has been really good to this church family <coughs> in the past three years. Um, but our work's not finished, and that's what this song is about. Greater things have yet to come. He has things for us to do. He's given us a commission and a command to go forth and share the good news of Christ. You are, you're the light in the dark. 
I'm not quite done with uh, Easter yet. As I've said, so much happens in that last week of Christ's earthly life. Uh, a lot of that we need to hear right now. And today's scripture, <clears throat> excuse me, is a perfect example of that. But we're going to begin uh, this morning with a question. Why is it that Christians are becoming more and more disliked in this country? Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, not least of which is the fact that Jesus said we would. He didn't just say that we'd be disliked. He said we'd be hated. He says in John 15, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So there's one reason. And it's one that guarantees we'll always have that struggle in life. If the world rejected Christ, it will surely reject the followers of Christ. But there are other reasons too. Uh, I don't know if there's ever really been a time uh, in our country when we could really be called a Christian nation, but certainly down through our history, we all shared a foundation of right and wrong that everybody depended on, regardless of their belief. And that foundation was almost entirely Christian. Almost everybody had at least a simple knowledge of God and the Bible, and those teachings were what came to be known as our common story. It's what drew us together. It's what helped us to trust our institutions. But that's not the case anymore, is it? Now there is no common story. Now everybody has their own truth. Right and wrong is being twisted and turned upside down. We've become a people that Isaiah warned us Never to become a nation that calls evil good and good evil, that puts darkness for light and light for darkness, that puts bitter for sweet and sweet for better. We're living in an age that looks a lot like the final verse in the book of Judges, right? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So when a group of people stand up against that and say, no, you got it wrong. There is one truth for everyone, and it's God's truth. People aren't going to like that. Another problem is that if we do have a national religion now, it is politics, isn't it? That's why we can't agree on anything anymore. And that's another reason why Christians are so disliked now, because when a lot of people see a Christian, they see a Republican, don't they? They don't see a savior, they see a party. Some of that is society's fault. Christians... And do vote for anybody they want. But that's not the story that gets told on the news. The very people who shout the loudest about not stereotyping are the ones who stereotype the most. The ones who say that we have to tolerate everything won't tolerate anyone who believes or thinks differently than they do. Still, though, a lot of this dislike is, is our fault, too. It is. And I read something this week that very neatly describes uh, why that's the case. E. Stanley Jones was a very well-known missionary in the middle part of the last century, and he had the occasion one day to meet with Gandhi, who was one of the most respected leaders in modern history. Gandhi was a Hindu, but he would often quote scripture in his speeches, especially scripture from the Sermon on the Mount. And Stanley Jones asked him about that. He said, Mr. Gandhi, you quote the words of Christ so often, so why do you reject becoming his follower. And Gandhi looked at him and he said, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. What do you think of that? Whether you agree with that or not, in polls and surveys, that is the biggest reason why Christians are becoming so disliked now. Mrs. Black told me before the service that she always heard God wants spiritual fruit and not religious nuts. <laughs> I said I'm going to steal that It's very true But a lot of non-Christians look at us And they see the nut variety They say we're hypocritical Non-believers tend to like Jesus At least they, they like their idea of Jesus And that's important to note Because people's ideas of Jesus And Jesus as he really is Are often two very different things but they don't like the people who follow Jesus because those followers, they say, don't live as Jesus lived and taught. Now, on one hand, it's not really fair, is it? 
No Christian is going to say they're perfect because they believe in Christ. We might be saved, but we're still sinners. We're still fallen creatures who do and say things that we shouldn't be doing and saying. The only difference is that we're forgiven. But on the other hand, these people do have a point. We might be fallen sinners, but God still expects his people to live differently than everybody else. His standard for believers is a lot higher than his standard for people who want nothing to do with him. The truth is that for the most part, people don't judge the value of Christ by looking at the Christian religion. They judge the value of Christ by looking at Christians. And that's important. We've been talking a lot these past months about revival and how much our community and our nation and world need that. But revival has to start with us, with God's people. Revival can only come the way that it's always come. And that is by people who don't know God looking at the people who do and saying, I see you living with a joy and a peace that I can't find. I want what you have. So how do I get it? Peace and joy are synonyms for what the Bible calls spiritual fruit. Jesus loved talking about bearing fruit. And there is one story in the Bible where he addresses this head on. That is found in Mark chapter 11. Turn there with me now. We're going to start with verses 12 through 14. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one eat, ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now let's skip down to verse, uh, verse 20. We'll be reading verses 20 through 24. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain will be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he said will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's get this out of the way right from the start. On a very basic level. Jesus just doesn't come off looking very good here, does he? He's headed toward Jerusalem where he's going to be crucified, coming from that dinner party in Bethany that we talked about a while back. And he spots this fig tree in the distance that's full of leaves. So Jesus goes in search of a little breakfast. But when he gets to the tree, there's no fruit. So Jesus curses the tree and he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now, there are only two places in Scripture where Jesus uses the power that he has to destroy someone. One is when he casts out the demons into that herd of pigs that then drown themselves in the sea. The other is right here, when he causes the fig tree to die. So what's going on here? And what are we to think of these verses? Jesus taught by using three different ways. He taught by referencing the prophets and the imagery of the Old Testament. And he taught through miracles. And he taught through parables. This is the only time in scripture that he uses all three at once. That can only mean the lesson that he's telling us is one that we better pay careful attention to. But Jesus walks to this fig tree because it says in verse 12, he's hungry. And I love that. We always have to keep in mind that Jesus was fully God, but also fully human. He was God in the flesh, but he was also flesh. He came to save you, but he also came to experience firsthand what it was like to be you. That way you can go to him with any weakness, any fear, any worry, knowing that he'll understand. And so we find places in the Gospels where Jesus knows what it's like to feel tired. We find places where he knows what it's like to feel burdened and overwhelmed. And right here, we see that Jesus knows what it's like to be hungry. He and the disciples are on the Mount of Olives, and there are fig trees everywhere. But this tree stands out because it's filled with leaves. And that's strange because Mark says at the end of verse 13, it's not the season for figs. Fig se 
season is actually three months away. So there's two questions we have here. First, why doesn't Jesus know that it's fig season? And second, since it isn't fig season, why curse the tree? Here's everything you need to know about fig trees. <laughs> A fig tree produces leaves around the end of March. Before the leaves, though, the trees produce these small little green knobs that are called early figs. And the poor would eat these early figs because they weren't very good, but they were still food. And after a time, these green figs, they fall off so that the real figs can grow. So even if a fig tree is out of season, if it's full of green leaves, there should be these little knobs of early figs. This tree doesn't have it. And here's what you need to remember. If a fig tree has leaves but no early figs, it is never going to produce any figs at all. Which means that this tree that Jesus and the disciples are standing around is useless. And it will always be useless. <clears throat> so when Jesus curses the tree and says, may no one ever eat from you again, that curse does not make the tree barren. The tree is already barren. Jesus speaks this curse in order to make its barrenness visible. But none of the disciples understand this. They have no idea what, what Jesus is doing here. And we know that by that last phrase in verse 14, and his disciples heard it. They hear Jesus say these words, but they, they can't comprehend their meaning. Jesus has done something that seems so out of character that the disciples can't help but pay attention. They're as shocked by this as we are. But remember what I said about the three ways that Jesus taught. Through miracles, through parables, and through the stories and images of the Old Testament. Now what happens with this fig tree is clearly a miracle. This tree will never produce fruit, but it's still healthy. And fig trees are known for their amount of sap and moisture. It takes months and even years of drought to wither a fig tree. But in verse 20, when they pass by this tree again the next morning, it's withered away to its roots. The green leaves are now brown and shriveled up in the dirt. There is nothing left but a dead tree. Matthew talks about this story, too, in his gospel. His account is a little different. Matthew says that the fig tree withered at once, which makes the miracle even more powerful. But we have to ask, then, why Matthew and Mark seem to have the details mixed up. Some of the older commentaries say that Jesus and the disciples passed by that tree the first time in the evening. So when Jesus curses it, it's so dark that the disciples can't tell that it's already withered. Only when they pass by again the next morning in the sun could they see that the tree's dead. But more modern commentaries point out something else. The gospel writers didn't always lay out their stories in chronological order. What they did instead was arrange their stories around kind of larger themes. And that's what Mark's doing here. Because notice what happens in between Mark's account of this fig tree. Look in verses 15 through 19. What happens there? Jesus goes to Jerusalem and cleanses the temple. He overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sell pigeons. He won't allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Mark is explaining what Jesus does in the temple by telling us about this barren fig tree. It's not just a miracle. It's an acted out parable. It's a warning both to Israel and to us about the cost of not only being unfruitful, but of looking fruitful and not backing it up. <clears throat> over and over in the Old Testament, Israel's described as God's vineyard, God's tree, God's planting. But over and over again, the nation that God planted wouldn't bear fruit. Israel's religion was empty. The scribes and the Pharisees worshipped the law more than they worshipped God. The people weren't holy they weren't faithful to God. They weren't loving to their neighbor. The synagogues were always open, but the teaching in them was lifeless. Israel had no good influence over its neighbors. They called themselves God's children, but lived like orphans who made up their own rules. The whole nation was a fig tree full of leaves, but it had become spiritually barren. Jesus stood by this tree that looked so beautiful and healthy on the outside, but it was dead on the inside. 
It showed signs of life and flourishing, but in reality it was barren. And the same thing could be said for the religious leaders of Israel, who looked righteous and godly on the outside, but they were cruel and corrupt on the inside, in their hearts. They had, no le they had leaves, but they had no fruit. So just as Jesus said to the tree, because you will not bear fruit now, may you never bear fruit again. He was saying the same to Israel itself. It was divine judgment, and God was out of patience. In just 40 years, give or take, the Romans would lay siege to Jerusalem, and they would destroy the very temple that Jesus said had become a den of thieves. But Jesus isn't only talking about the people of Israel and the temple here. He's also talking about us. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of Christians who are like that fig tree. Yes. They look righteous and godly on the outside, but they're dead on the inside. Mm -hmm. They go to church and they carry their fancy thick Bibles, but there's a lack of spiritual life inside them. And because of that, there's no fruit. This is a hard, harsh parable that Jesus acts out. But that's exactly why he does it. He wants to make us uncomfortable because he's giving us a warning. He says to you and to me, if you really find rest in my arms, if you really know the peace of my forgiveness and grace, if I really am your Lord, then all those things need to be reflected in your life. You know what Jesus is called uh, in the New Testament? The second Adam. He's called that because he was sent to undo all of the damage that the first Adam did in the Garden of Eden. When the first Adam sinned, what was his first response? He saw that he was naked, and he wanted to clothe himself. And what did Adam and Eve use to clothe themselves? Leaves from a fig tree. The first Adam went to the fig tree looking for leaves. The second Adam comes to the fig tree looking for fruit. He searches our hearts to see if there's any real faith. Searches our lives to see if there's any real joy. Searches our minds to see if there's any real peace. Searches our lives to see if there's any real walking with God, any indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And if he does not find those things, then all the church going that you do and the prayers that you speak and the sermons that you hear and the scripture that you read doesn't matter because they're all leaves. The people who get upset over Jesus killing a tree because he couldn't find any fruit, they better start thinking about what Jesus is going to do to them for the same reason. Because guess what? Our Lord has a right to find fruit wherever he knows it should be. Jesus had every right to expect fruit from a tree with green leaves. And he has every right to find fruit in every person who calls him Savior. And I'll ask you, who's worse in God's eyes? Someone who's a barren tree because they refuse to believe in Christ? Or somebody who's a tree filled with leaves who calls Christ Lord but has no fruit? Jesus had every right to condemn a tree that would lead the hungry and the poor away from the road that they were on with the promise of food. Isn't that what we do? If our lives as Christians don't produce any more fruit than the lives of people who don't know Jesus at all? If we say that the grace of God is in us, that our lives don't reflect that grace, aren't we as much a curse to the world as a tree that promises fruit but doesn't deliver that promise? Jesus did not only curse that fig tree because it could never bear fruit. He also cursed that fig tree so that it could never deceive anybody else. So according to Mark, Jesus curses the fig tree, and then he and his disciples continue on to Jerusalem. Jesus cleanses the temple, and then they return to Bethany. And now it's evening, so the fig tree can't be seen from the road. But the next morning, as they're walking back to the city, they pass by this tree again. And in verse 20, we see that it's withered away at the roots. The judgment has been carried. And Peter says, look, Rabbi, the tree cursed is withered. And how does Jesus respond in verses 22 through 24? He starts talking about prayer. Why does Jesus start talking about prayer here? Here's what he's saying, both to Peter and the disciples and to us. He's saying... You are my instruments. The disciples would be instruments God used to transform the entire world and bring forth fruit from all nations. 
For us, we're to be the instruments that God uses to bring forth fruit from a community, from a nation, and from a world that's sunk deep into darkness and despair. Bearing fruit means having faith in God. We cannot produce fruit on our own. It can't happen. We're too broken. We're too selfish. God has to produce that fruit through us. And the only way that happens is through prayer that's rooted in the faith of God. Look at the first words of verse 23 there. Truly I say unto you. Jesus often uses that phrase in the Gospels as a way to show us that what he's going to say next is important. He says the power that's available to us is the kind of power that can move mountains. It can cause miracles. It can remove guilt. It can purify the heart. And he says in verse 24 that this power, this faith rooted in prayer that bears fruit, is yours for the taking. All you got to do is ask. God has it all in his hands, ready to pour it out on you and through you. And Jesus says that for as powerful and life-changing as that faith is in producing fruit, it's also simple. He's not talking about an extraordinary faith. He says that all the faith you need is the size of a mustard seed. So if we refuse to ask for something that God gives so easily, then why shouldn't he lay judgment on us if we refuse? If we refuse such a great and abundant and free gift, do we really love God at all? The Christian life is about a lot more than just going to church and reading your Bible and praying and trusting Jesus. All those things are important, but they're important because they produce fruit that transforms you into somebody who acts and thinks and talks and lives differently than people who don't know God at all. That is how revival starts. That's how the church grows. That's how Christ looks at you and said, here is my salt in a world that's decaying. Here is my light to a world gone dark. If Jesus really is your Lord, if the Holy Spirit really is in you, your life will be constantly producing heavenly fruit. And what is that fruit? Paul tells us in Galatians 5. It's love. It's joy. It's peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. It's gentleness and self-control. That is the fruit that defines the Christian life. But we still gossip, don't we? We're still arrogant. We still talk down to people and belittle them. Still, we're just downright mean and nasty. We speak words that hurt, and then we try to cover it up with humor. We say, I'm just kidding. If you ever say, I'm just kidding, after you say something, that is a sign that what you just said is terrible. <laughs> if we, we do all of those things, and Jesus curses the barren fig tree, he says, there is no excuse in the world for you to be barren. But we try out all those excuses, don't we? I know, I got a short temper. That's just how I was made. You think Jesus accepts that excuse? No. He says, with me, you're a new creation. Put on the new person I made you to be and leave that old person behind. I know I can say hateful things, but you don't know what I've been through. You think Jesus accepts that excuse? No. He says, don't think about the former things. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. We can make all kinds of excuses about why our lives aren't fruitful. That this fig tree in Mark had a great excuse for not being fruitful. It's not fig season. Jesus still cursed it. That's what he thinks of our excuses. Are you mine or not, he asks. Because it's one or the other. And the best way to know that answer is by the kind of person you are in him. I am the vine, Jesus says in John 15. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. And then Christ says this, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Did you get that? You don't just get to say that you're a disciple of Christ. You have to prove it. And you don't prove it by knowing all the Bible verses, by how you vote on election day, by what your stance is on some social issue. You prove it by the way you treat people. 
You prove it by your love for everybody, regardless of who they are. You prove it by the joy you have in every circumstance, by the patience you offer, by the kindness that you give to everyone you meet, by the goodness of your words and the faithfulness of your daily devotions and prayers, by the gentleness you show to others, and by the self-control you show to yourself. Because Jesus says your faith is shown by your fruit. This story is a warning. We should be thankful for it. We need a God who gives us warnings as much as he gives us grace. Because our lives can look like healthy trees, but our roots can be dry. There might not be any fruit at all under those leaves. That's why we got to take a hard look at ourselves. Because sometimes all those leaves on our trees can fool even ourselves. We're called to shoot for perfection in the people that we are. Even though God says we'll never get there in this life. But I take a look around this country, and I see a lot of Christians who aren't even trying anymore. They look around, and, and, and they sound, and they live just like everybody else does. They're every bit as mean and hateful and filled with pride. Will God bring revival when so many of his people are living that way? Because that's where revival starts. It begins with God, and he starts with his church. Every pastor will tell you that COVID really hurt the American church. Attendance is down almost everywhere now. A lot of churches have closed. And we can ask where God was in all of that. I'll tell you, God was right in the middle of all that. Amen. I think God used COVID to rid our churches of a lot of people who just went through the motions. A lot of people who just had one foot in church and the other in the world. And I think he did that because he's getting ready to do something wonderful, something amazing with those children of his who stood firm. Same thing with these big denominations that are about to split over all this social issue stuff. Some of those churches are saying, well, we got to evolve to look more like the world. Jesus says, uh-uh. Wow. The more your church looks like the world, the less it's going to look like me. <laughs> What's Jesus see when he looks at his church? Love or hate? Joy or doubt? Peace or worry? Patience or rage? Kindness or hurtfulness? Does he see fruit or does he just see decoration? We say, bring revival, Lord, and we should. We should pray for that. It's what the world needs now more than ever. But let the next words out of our mouths be, and let it begin with us. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful to have a God of grace and mercy, a God who never gives up on us, even when we give up on ourselves. A God of love who loves so deeply that you give us these warnings to live the lives that you want us to live. Lives that are fuller than we can imagine. Lives bearing fruit that never spoils. Lives that feed the loss of this world. For all of these things, Father, we depend upon you. Give us the peace of your presence. Give us a desire to empty our hearts of ourselves so that they may be filled with you. Let us have the faith that grows. Faith that draws the hungry and the poor. And when they come, let them find fruit that satisfies all their needs. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lord, I want to be a Christian. I want to be more loving, more holy. I want to be like Jesus. Would you stand as we sing?
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.